If you've got a car in the DC metro area like I do, you know that sometimes it can be a real bummer, which is why there's Car Care to Go, the future of car maintenance and repair. I recently had to get repairs on my car and they picked up my car from my apartment and they brought it back when the work was done. They also texted me to let me know what services were being completed on my car, so I got full control. The valet was free and you can get your free synthetic oil change for $20.23. Like what you heard? Book now at carcaretogo.com. Today on CityCast DC, this week marks Equal Pay Day, the point in the year that women have to work just to break even with men's salaries from the year before. Now, talking openly about what you make is a big part of closing the pay gap. And while that can be awkward for the rest of the country, here in DC, we're actually kind of cool with talking about what we make. I'm here with the creator of the popular salary transparency TikTok account to talk about the push for pay transparency. Today is Wednesday, March 15th. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what DC's talking about. Hannah Williams, you are the founder of one of my all-time favorite TikToks, the Salary Transparency Street TikTok. Um, When I got my gig here at CityCast, I had to put together some pitches of possible stories, and I pitched this one. I was like, oh my God, you should definitely talk to Hannah. Um, So I'm (laughs) so excited to speak to you today. That's awesome, Bridget. Oh my gosh, I'm so stoked to hear it. I I love talking to OGs. (laughs) Oh, yes. You know, I first became aware of what you're doing on TikTok through the TikToks that were in D.C. How does D.C. compare to other cities when it comes to salary transparency? Honestly, I love filming in D.C. or the DMV area more than any place we've gone. We started in the DMV. We live in this area. So we're like kind of locals and people just like have this excitement about them when they see us. Like they don't I feel like people don't really see us as celebrities, although they act like they do. I just love connecting with them. I'm like, you guys are our people. You guys are the community that we really started with. And so it's just like coming home every time we go out and people are so nice. Um, I would say eastern cities are usually like kind of tough like new york city is rough oh my gosh we get humbled so quickly out there (laughs) but dc is a little different i mean we've still got people on the street that you know think that we're trying to get them to sign up to donate money and things like that but for the most part they're really open to the conversation and they seem excited about it too to share about their careers like people are proud of their careers which you see a lot in dc Yeah, some of the people that you come up to, I can tell by their face that they are so glad you asked. They're so excited to talk about (laughs) it. They have been waiting to be asked to spill the tea on their salary for a while. Why were you all certain that D.C. would be like it would work in D.C. what you all do? I love that people think that we're that smart, but it was really just like random. And we started in D.C. because we lived here. You know, it was a matter of location over anything. So I live in Alexandria, Virginia, outside in the suburbs. You know, it's way too expensive in the city for me. And we just needed a place to go. And I went to Georgetown. I'm a frequent person around Georgetown. And I was like, what a great place to start doing interviews. You know, there's great foot traffic. So it, it was really like a seamless idea for us to go out on the street where we live. I wish that I had been like more strategic about it, (laughs) but it was really just a random choice. (laughs) Have you had any surprising findings doing this in D.C.? So the first day that actually we got interviews on camera because the mic worked was in Georgetown. People don't know that the day before that, we had gone out to like Capitol Hill with a different microphone and we were going to try the interviews and we had two microphones and we were like, if this one doesn't work, we have to try the other. Surprise, it didn't work. So that first day we lost like all our interviews, but that was the first day that we actually went out to try. And we came across this one guy, middle-aged white guy, I'd say maybe in his 40s or so. And it was Friday around like five or six o'clock. City was empty. You know, everyone's going home way before that. He was just getting off work. And, you know, I approached him, asked him, hey, you know, we're doing interviews. Can I ask you what you do and how much you make? And he was like, absolutely not. But I'll tell you off camera. And I was like, "Okay, like, I don't really care to hear off camera, but sure. And he told me he was a lawyer and he made two million dollars. Oh, my God. To this day is actually like the highest salary we've heard from anyone. And it kills me that it was like the first actual day we went 
didn't get it on camera, nothing. I think I just stood there with like my jaw dropped for a couple seconds and was like, thanks, have a great day. (laughs) Why do you think he didn't want to tell you on camera? I think it's really like we see this taboo or like this spread among demographics and, you know, people who are willing to share and people who aren't. And usually what I find in addition to age, gender, race, demographics, and all those differences is with salaries, people who make really little and people who make a lot are the ones that are least likely to share. And so I think that he was probably one of those that made a lot. And I don't know, there's this humbleness or something that people don't want to put out there. There's also people who don't want their family or their friends to know how much they make. So I think that might be why. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting. I do remember one specific couple that sticks with me. It was a Black couple pushing a baby and they both worked in tech and they had high salaries, but like, I remember in the comments mm-hmm. of the TikTok, people were like, oh, they could probably, with their backgrounds, they could make higher salaries elsewhere. And then For somebody sure. else was like, oh, they probably have work-life balance things, like they have a baby. Mm-hmm. And I think that it does open people up to a level of scrutiny and like question mm-hmm. asking and filling in the Absolutely. blanks about choices that you've made about your life and your family. There's not many other things that would really invite that in quite the same way as salary transparency. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, I echo that. And I'm really protective of the people that we interview. Like, I'll admit it. Like, if people say really nasty, like mean things, I don't even report the comments. I just delete them and block those people. Like, if you're willing to be transparent in a way that we want the world to be, whether people agree or disagree with how much you make, you shouldn't be scrutinized for that, for just being open about your salary. And it's really frustrating when people bully people that we interview and question them like, oh, well, that was a bad decision and things like that. And it's like, you can't learn about people in a 60 second clip. There's so much context that we can't cover that I really hope people consider, but sometimes they don't. And it does open them up to scrutiny in the comments, but definitely in their personal lives as well. So they're really brave. I protect them with all my heart. Well, I appreciate the way that you intentionally foster that kind of vibe because salary transparency helps everybody. Like knowing what people make is the only way that we're going to get pay equity and things like that. But if we have a climate where if people do talk about how much they make, they're opening themselves up to bullying and negative comments and all of that, people won't do it. So we know that the federal government has public salaries, right? And so if I wanted to, for folks who work for the federal government, I could look up how much they make. Do you think mm-hmm. that that's one of the reasons why people in D.C. are willing to talk about how much they make? Because in some cases, it's already public information. Absolutely. And it kills me every single time I meet someone who's like, oh, I work for the government. It's already transparent. I'm like, I freaking know. Like, <laughs> we need to make this like a nationwide, federal nationwide thing. Like, It bothers me so much that we have systems in place already that are fully transparent, that work, you know, the government, the military, you name it. And like we, for some reason, can't convince corporate America to see different. It kills me. And sometimes I I meet people in D.C. These are the ones that kind of make me laugh is um, when people are like, oh, well, it's already transparent. Like you you could just look it up. Yeah, You don't need to interview me. And I'm like, Yeah, but like people don't know that. So it would be wonderful to hear from you otherwise, you know, and still share the information and have somebody say, this is already a thing. It's been a thing forever. So I don't know why y'all are fussing about it. (laughs) You know, that's my attitude about it. (laughs) Do you hear that a lot? Like, oh, it's already transparent. Look it up. Definitely for government workers, which is pretty prevalent in D.C. And like sometimes we have um, teachers and like people that work at hospitals and such that are like, well, we're internally transparent. Like you can look it up like it's online. And I'm like, okay, well, (laughs) it would still be super helpful for you to share that because people don't know people are still getting underpaid we still have these pay gaps that are persisting. And so not everyone's going to work for the government. The majority of us are going to work for private corporate America. So we need to talk about how these transparent systems are good, you know, and how they're working for you. And if they're not, how can we improve them so that we can use them as a model in corporate America? You know, these are conversations we need to have. Yeah. To that point, like, would you get behind something like adopting some sort of GS scale or transparency around private companies? Like, is that something that you think would be useful or good? Definitely. I think that's my ultimate goal really is to make pay transparency a law. It has to be something that is being federally enforced nationwide and corporate America needs to respond to that. I think the goal is transparency looks different in all organizations. It can be 
completely transparent where a total stranger can look into a company and see what a secretary is making, or it can be internally transparent, you know, where they list it on job listings and such, but there's not a internal database that you can search for. There's a couple different models that work differently and have pros and cons for different companies based on their size and their model. But ultimately, what we need to have is that beginning transparency in that job description. When people go to a company, they need to know that the salary is worth their while. If they do an interview and they take the time out of their day and their work day and their PTO to apply an interview at your company, make it worth their while. Make sure that they know what they're going to be paid. And also keep practicing that within the company. Once you have that in the job description, then people internally can look up, you know, when roles are open and see what they're hiring for. Are you up to par with that? That's like the most simple way to have a transparent system, but still guarantee that internally and externally, people are getting paid what they deserve and everyone's on the fair playing field. But I think the GS system is interesting with the different tiers and such. What I love about the GS system and like the scale is they really have it down pat being able to explain why people are at the level they are. And I think that's what corporate America struggles with is they cannot justify how much people are getting paid. A lot of companies are just like, eh, $5,000 bonus here. You look like you can make 80K. Like, we'll give you that without being able to justify to that person. We pay you X because of X, X, X. You need to be able to give that answer. And I think that's what the GS scale is really good at, is they have all those qualifications and such. That's probably why their applications are so lengthy. (laughs) But it's helpful, you know, people know why they're getting paid, how much and what they need to do next to get to the next level. That's not clear in corporate America right now. It's a great scale that they should follow. FrameBridge, the custom framing company, is the perfect way to refresh your space for the new year by framing everything, everything that matters to you. That's because they can FrameBridge just about anything. Game day jerseys, selfies, your anniversary dinner menu, artwork, your favorite movie poster, a love letter from the people at CityCast DC, anything. Here's how it works. You go to FrameBridge.com and upload a digital photo. If you have a physical piece to frame, like a poster, they will send you complimentary packaging to safely mail it into their owned and operated studio where the framing will begin. You preview the piece online in dozens of frame styles. You choose your favorites. The experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your piece and deliver your finished piece directly to your door, ready to hang. And instead of paying hundreds, their prices start at 39 bucks. You can order online at FrameBridge.com or you can shop at a FrameBridge store near you, which if you live in D.C. means a whole bunch of stores. Get started today. Frame your photos or give someone the perfect gift. Go to FrameBridge.com and place your order now. Do you think that if we had more of that kind of transparency in corporate America or private companies, that companies would rather than making it so that folks were paid what they you know, actually deserved or things like that, do you think that companies would just lower salaries to be like, oh, we don't want to have to justify what we're paying. We can't explain this. So let's just lower it for everybody. If they did that, (laughs) I'd be so disappointed. And I think a lot of workers would be too. There are some statistics and research out there that show that when you do have a transparent system, you see the highest earners, you know, white men, Asian men, the top of the food barrel there, they plateau. Meanwhile, everyone else that's been behind comes back up and that's where it levels out. I care about everybody getting paid on the same level, even if that's a little bit less over time in terms of the scale we see it growing. As long as everyone's on the same playing field, then you can attack it together. But as long as you have those discrepancies and people making less just because of their race or their gender, you're not going to have a good system or company culture. And so (laughs) if you choose to inevitably lower salaries as well, but also not, you know, bring people up to par, you're just going to have people leave. You know, I think we live in a really interesting age in work culture where we're holding companies accountable and corporate accountable. And I don't see that slowing down. So information is power. And if we see trends like that, I think workers are going to respond negatively as they should. Speaking of that, is there any legislation in the D.C. area around salary transparency that folks should know about? 
um, the DC Pay Range Act of 2022, which I hope they update to 2023 if they pass it. (laughs) I testified in support of it back in December, and it's a really great bill. It really models the New York City Pay Range Act that we saw where really it just calls for that upfront pay transparency and job descriptions for companies that have, I think, four or more employees is around that realm. And you have to be able to give a fair range, which the good faith range is something that I really detest. I think we need to be a little bit more specific because we do see companies skirting around it. And as I mentioned before, I love the age that we're in where we're holding companies accountable because the ones that are doing that are getting called out on social media. And that's going to really deter and ruin their reputation over time. So I hope they see that that's not a good move to skirt around the law. (laughs) But that's the only critique I would have about the bill is I think they need to be a bit more specific based on what we saw with the Pay Range Act in New York City happening. But otherwise, it's a step in the right direction, you know, and we can learn from our mistakes. We can do little um, improvements to bills over time and we'll get there eventually with the right system. Oh, nothing fills me with more like petty joy than when someone screenshots a job application with either no salary listed or like a truly just insulting, offensively low salary for what they're asking for someone to do. And it just gets dragged all over social media. I'm like liking every (laughs) comment. I love it. I love it. I live for it. Yeah. Yeah. The the DC area is surprisingly like pretty strong when it comes to page transparency. Why do you think that is? Definitely the federal presence in D.C. is everything. Um, We see a lot of federal government employees, and so they're already practicing pay transparency. Military employees are practicing pay transparency. But I think D.C. is dope. Like there's this awesome culture in D.C. about, you know, the taxation without representation, just this real strength and sense of identity that this area like doesn't take shit like <laughs> I hope I can swear <laughs> go for but it they, they stand up for their rights you know and they're loud and proud about it and I'm I really love where I live because I identify so much with that energy and I think it fuels me to keep going and I think it's also because we have proximity to the government and we're like yeah you're in our neighborhood we can make change but <laughs> you know it's little baby steps like that and that kind of energy that does cause actual change that will help a lot of people and so I just think it's the energy in this city. It's people also make good salaries in white collar work. But then we also see a lot of need for representation of teachers and social workers and metro workers. Like it kills me whenever I do interviews and I talk to people that I feel have possibly the highest responsibility in our society, like teachers, educators and such, and the people that make our cities run. And they usually make the least amount, which is really frustrating. But back to like DC being proud, I think that workers are still proud of what they do and they're open to sharing because they want that knowledge out there. They want representation, um, taxation without representation. It goes the same way with salaries. You know, we don't know what we don't know. And until we put those salaries out on a pedestal and we show a face to that salary, we won't implement that change. It's like a quintessential D.C. thing. Like we're a city of rabble rousers. And because people here do, some of us do make good, comfortable livings, we can advocate for other people and can be a little bit more of like an agitator on behalf of others so that we're all paid what we're worth. Absolutely. I think nail on the head. You got it. Like we really stand up for each other and we want to help each other. And is there anything that we want to make sure gets included that we didn't ask? I'll shout it out there. I'll do some shameless promo. Um, We have a salary database on our website. You can find us on all social media, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, you name it. We're at Salary Transparency. You can find our salary database. It's completely free, totally accessible. We have really great, like over 4,000 salaries that have great information behind them. We capture a lot of information that can help you like career advice and all the details that you want to know about people's salaries. So go check it out if you want a good resource for salary transparency. Great. Thanks for being here, Hannah. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks for having me. And before you go, here's some quick news. D.C.'s ACLU is suing the federal government on behalf of a woman who says that she was injured by low-flying military helicopters during the 2020 protests. The ACLU says that this strategy for dispersing U.S. civilian protesters was unprecedented. Meanwhile, Nancy Yao has been chosen as the founding director of the not-yet-built American Women's History Museum. The Smithsonian selection process took two years. Yao is currently the president of the Museum of Chinese in America in New York and will start her new job on June 5th. Yao says she feels pumped to get started, but there's a lot of work to do. (laughs) 
And today's DC Life Hack is Washingtonians sometimes scorn the impact of having the federal government right here, but it's definitely got its benefits too. One of them is the White House Easter egg roll. It's such a fun event for kids, and the lottery opens this year on Thursday at 10 a.m., so be ready. The actual event will be on April 10th, and we'll post more information in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, tell someone whose salary you're curious about. We'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then. Don't roast me. I live in the suburbs. So don't be like, he said she's from DC. She's not. I know. Don't <laughs> roast me. I'm Hannah. proud to be in the DMV area. I'm really proud. I love this area. <laughs>